It's raining again here in Cooksville, Wisconsin, which is just as well, because today we'll be looking at part two of the Low Tech Innovations panel discussion from Earth Day last week. We'll be hearing from people working on water, cooking, and energy, which are all key components of a sustainable future. This is the Low Tech Podcast. Hello and welcome. I'm Scott Johnson from the Low Technology Institute, your host for podcast number 47 on April 29th, 2022, coming to you out of the Low Tech Institute's gardens in Cooksville, Wisconsin. Thanks for joining us. Today we're going to be listening again to a panel discussion on low tech innovation that was hosted by the French Embassy's Office of Science and Technology. This is the second part of a podcast on this topic. If you haven't listened to part one, just head back in your podcast feed. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at low underscore techno. Like us on Facebook, find us on Instagram, subscribe to us on YouTube, and check out our website, lowtechinstitute.org. There you can find both of our podcasts as well as information about joining and supporting the Institute and its research. Also, some podcast distributors put ads on podcasts, and unless you hear me doing an ad, somebody else is making money on that advertising. This is where I usually make a short pitch for you to visit our Patreon page and support the Institute directly. But instead, uh, just like last week, I'd like to call attention to the organizations represented in these presentations. You can find links to all of their respective organizations in the show notes and also at the bottom of the screen if you're watching this on YouTube. Please check them out and consider supporting them directly. To kick us off, um, I was very honored to be asked to speak a little bit about my own work um, as part of the panel. So I'll just give you a quick um, a quick presentation on uh, my work. So sharing my screen here, um, I work at MIT D-Lab, um, a program at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge. Um, uh, my background is in civil engineering, and I came to D-Lab because I was really interested in sort of the social impacts of engineering and how we could be um, more participatory about the types of projects um, that we engage in as engineers. So D-Lab is about designing for a more equitable world. And we do that by working with people around the world to develop and advance um, more collaborative approaches um, as we seek practical solutions to global poverty. And because we are at a university, um, our, our program is very focused on engaging students effectively in socially impactful work, which is um, by nature low tech. Um, we were founded uh, 20 years ago. We're celebrating our 20th anniversary this October. Um, and we have offered uh, 24 different classes at MIT that look at various aspects of low tech. Um, you can see in this photo um, a, a prosthetics uh, class that is working with um, with users in Indonesia. Um, and over 2,500 MIT students have enrolled in our classes, many of whom have gone on trips um, around the world to engage in effective user design and participatory development. Um, we have a number of different research programs and field practice programs, um, and our staff is made up of practitioners with deep experience in, in various parts of the world. So we work in over 25 different countries, and COVID permitting, we hope to be able to start taking our students um, on field experiences again soon. So um, we have a few design principles at DLab, which you'll, you'll see have some overlap with the principles of low tech that we've been discussing today. We think about how to be more inclusive when we are designing for users living in poverty, whether they be in the US or abroad. And we engage in co-creation or co-design processes with people living in poverty to engage them, to teach them the design process and to make that process as participatory and open as possible as we are thinking about um, projects in the food and water and energy spaces around the world. And the methodology we've developed at DLab is really focused on um, what we call creative capacity building. So building the confidence and the capacity that is needed for users to engage in the design process to address whatever, whatever it may serve them for in their lives, regardless of whether they're working together with trained designers or not. So we think about the design process and how it can be applied to these low tech projects more effectively. So I've worked with students for the past 10 years at D-Lab, um, engaging them in low tech projects that are really thinking about how to make that design um, and engineering process more inclusive. I'll just tell you about one of those today focused in the water and sanitation space. 
This is a picture of me with two of my students who are wearing yellow shirts um, and a family in El Salvador who engaged in um, material experiments with us to be able to construct compost toilets um, with local materials as cheaply and effectively as possible while maintaining cleanliness and the effectiveness of the compost toilet system. So just uh, for those of you who are not familiar with compost toilets, um, this is a method of um, very low water toilet building. Um, the compost toilet basically separates liquid waste and solid waste because then that solid waste in the absence of excess moisture can be composted in a chamber underneath the latrine and can be used um, as, as fertilizer, as soil, once it has composted over the course of six months. Um, and so it's a, it's a technology that's been deployed all over the world. It, it has a very low environmental footprint. Um, it is flood resistant. It addresses some of the issues um, with uh, more traditional pit latrines in parts of the world that are prone to seasonal flooding. Um, and it is a, an odor-free um, method of building a latrine that, is, that has been well received um, by, by people who need latrines um, in many different parts of the world. Um, so these, these latrines obviously could be built out of many different building materials, but we were really looking at how to radically reduce the cost of building these latrines um, in Central America. And so you can see in this photo, if I go back to this photo, oops, you can see um, materials like bamboo, um, uh, adobe bricks um, underneath the, the plaster um, that have been used to um, bring the, the cost of this toilet down from, from an original proposal that was more focused on exported materials like concrete blocks. So we have three goals with this project, which are goals that I could say extend to a number of different um, D-Lab projects. One of them was to really radically reduce the cost by focusing on local materials and on verifying um, our comfort with using those materials from a structural standpoint. So bamboo is a, a fast growing renewable resource in many parts of the world, including Central America. And so we were really looking at what we could do with bamboo and engaging the family members, the community members in learning how they already construct with bamboo and how that could be used in the context of the toilet. So rigorous um, engineering analysis of these materials uh, was an important component. The second goal was to really guide the students to be thoughtful participants in this design process, not the authorities. So in terms of thinking about um, um, using indigenous materials and, um, and, and really ensuring that um, the users of the toilets felt confident in how to compost the material and, and maintain the cleanliness of the toilet, the students really had to sort of pull back from maybe roles that they had played before um, as more leaders of the design process and think about how to be effective participants in the design process. And so here you see students interviewing, sort of spending time with potential users um, as they go about their daily tasks to learn more about what their needs are. The third goal was really to follow up and, and reflect on the impact of the design project. So although we spent a month um, working with families building these initial prototypes, we came back six months later and a year later um, to continue um, analyzing how the materials were holding up, um, performing more tests, and, and making improvements to the process of the composting um, to ensure that, that families were comfortable with it and were using it effectively. So that follow-up with future groups of students who come back and sort of help maintain experiments and, and gather feedback from, from the users is a very important component of our work. Um, so uh, thank you very much for, for letting me give you a short introduction to my work. Um, I'm happy to take questions and, and very excited to engage new partners around the world in DLab projects. Thank you. Without further ado, I will um, resu resume wearing my moderator hat and, um, and move on to our next speaker, Sophie Lyman, um, Executive Director of Solar Household Energy in Washington, DC. Sophie, looking forward to hearing about um, some solar technologies from you. All right, thank you so much, Libby. Um, yes, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me to part be a part of this panel. My name is Sophie Lyman. I'm the Director of Solar Household Energy and I'll be talking about solar thermal energy for fuel-free cooking. We are a small nonprofit based in Washington, DC with international projects. And our mission is to unleash the potential of solar cooking to improve social and environmental conditions in sun-rich areas around the world. We primarily carry out field projects, but we also do education and research and development for solar cooking technology. So before I talk about solar cookers, I've got to talk about the problem of dirty cook stoves. So the Three Stone Fire um, is used by 
or rudimentary cooked stoves is used by 3 billion people around the world. That's more than a third of the world population. You can see these three stone fires here. And it um, collecting fuel for these fires is, can be dangerous. Women go out, walk for miles to collect fuel wood. They are um, faced with sexual and gender-based violence. Um, as you can see, it's also backbreaking labor and time consuming. It can be very costly, for, especially for families living in cities who have to buy fuel. So for example, um, a family of eight in Haiti, it, for them it costs $2 a day, and that's, you know, many of the world's poorest families live on $2 a day. Here's um, a stark example of deforestation it can cause. Uh, in Haiti, they primarily use fuel wood and DR, they use gas to cook. Um, it is also a big factor in uh, mortality, 4 million, it causes 4 million premature deaths per year, according to the World Health Organization, primarily from respiratory and cardiovascular disease. And it is, of course, a contributor to climate change um, and black carbon, which is the soot emits heat. So now I'll talk about solar cooking solutions. I'm just going to fly over these slides because there are so many different types of solar cookers, and I just want to make you aware of them. And you can you know, research them later on on the solar cooking wiki or look at these slides. So. This is a low-tech technology. I'm not talking about solar photovoltaic, which uses electricity. We're just talking about black pots and reflectors. So you need a black pot to convert sunlight to heat energy. You can retain that heat with a greenhouse enclosure, a transparent plastic bag or a glass top, and you can capture more sunlight with reflectors. And this is a feasible, viable technology for most of the developing world, as you can see in the red, orange, yellow areas. So your basic very low tech so solar panel cooker is a cook it. It's basically cardboard covered with aluminum foil. Um, the black pot is in a turkey oven bag. You can make this for a few dollars at home and you can cook a chicken in two hours with just this very low tech technology. The hot pot on the right is basically a more durable version of that. It'll last over 10 years. Um, that works like a crock pot. Now we have our ovens for baking, roasting veggies, etc. cetera. Um, we have parabolic solar stoves that work like your oven top range, um, like solar flames under the pot make, make it um, so that temperatures reach frying and sauteing uh, temperatures. We also have tube cookers with vacuum insulation for um, good heat retention. We have Fresnel lenses if you wanna cook from above. We have solar electric hybrid cookers, um, which have backup electricity if there's no sunshine um, or backup gas when the sun isn't shining. We also have fixed focus solar cookers for indoor community cooking and um, slightly more advanced cookers with thermic fluid that allow cooking uh, when the sun isn't shining, even at night. I'll end with uh, one of the world's largest solar cooking system, I think the largest, uh, which cooks for 100,000 people per day at the Shirdi Sai Baba Temple in India. So this um, is a map from Solar Cookers International, which shows that there are over 4 million solar cookers used worldwide, impacting over 14.3 million people. So I'll talk a little bit about some of Solar Household Energy's projects. We carry out humanitarian aid. Um, we work with local partners. So we usually plant the seed and let the local partners continue without us. We started with a 50 hot pot project in Gaga refugee camp in Chad and they added another 200. Um, we are one of many partners in an education project creating a university level uh, course. And these are our many partners. Um, we carry out research and development. So we helped design the hot pot over 20 years ago, which is a very simple um, solar cooker. And then our a partner in Mexico, FMCN, has distributed or sold over 20,000 hot pots in Mexico, and there's over 30,000 in use worldwide. Um, our latest, well, one of our latest projects focused on trying to kickstart a social enterprise, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about this one. We use the Haines Solar Cooker, that one there. It's basically a more powerful yet uh, far more affordable version of the hot pot, still very durable. And we started out by doing market research. What are the existing cooking technologies? We see you know, a very simple open fire, um, some charcoal grills, a few people of gas. 
um, and our entrepreneur, our field project manager, who wanted to start this enterprise, can be seen here training, uh, recruiting and training solar cooking ambassadors. So these are women who live in very rural, re remote communities um, who want to promote and sell solar cookers to their neighbors and friends. So here's Bibiana on our left. She's our star promoter. And here's some very happy customers who are seeing solar cooked rice and beans. And one of the beauty of these solar cookers is that they're very safe and easy to use. You know, instead of hovering over a smoky fire with her baby, this woman can just set in the sun and, and leave it be for a couple hours and come back and her food is cooked. Even the husband got into it, which is great. Um, one of the nice things about these panel cookers is that they act as ovens. So most people have a stove. They've got something with big flames. You can't really bake cakes or, or bake bread and things like that. So this is a very um, affordable alternative to make cakes and they love it. And so um, we use these solar cooking ambassadors because they're in their community. They, they know everybody, these are small towns and they're there in the long run to ensure long-term adoption and satisfaction. And they're there to you know, make any repairs, make any replacements if needed. And they're always in touch with our main entrepreneur um, and they help carry out surveys too. So she's role is to of course, kickstart these things, find a field project manager, um, help with the training, and then also do some monitoring and evaluation. So we, care, we have um, usually people on the ground carry out surveys and focus groups. Uh, we measure adoption, how much are they using it? Are they keeping it in good condition? As well as impact, what are they noticing in terms of like any health improvements? Are they coughing less from reduced smoke exposure? And um, are, they, are they seeing it in their pocketbooks? We um, try to use international standards for m &Es, such as those developed by the UN Foundation's Clean Cooking Alliance, as well as Solar Cookers International and the International Standards Organization. One of our board members is part of a committee of the ISO to develop clean cooking standards. So this all sounds wonderful, but of course there are many challenges on the ground. Um, most people cannot afford to buy a solar cooker, even though in the long run it saves you a lot of money because it's cooking for free for five to 10 years. Um, and they don't know how it works. So most people are not willing to risk that kind of um, investment. And also even though the woman does the cooking, the husband usually makes the financial decisions. There's many social and cultural challenges. Um, solar cookers are really unlike any other cook stove you, you see. So if you don't understand how light reflects upon reflectors and it, it can look like witchcraft and it can lead to incorrect usage. And often women don't have the luxury of trial and error. Women's gotta be ready on time and they, they can't throw food away if it just doesn't work for whatever reason. And finally, with some of the slow cooking panel cookers, sorry, um, that can mean starting to cook a little earlier, which can be an adjustment in your schedule and thinking ahead. And of course, there's the obvious challenges of the fact that you cannot cook in cloudy weather. And for some solar cookers, you can't cold and cook in very cold weather. You can cook in the snow with box cookers and parabolics, but not with panel cookers. So I'll just talk a little bit about um, partnering with us. If you're a nonprofit who's um, working uh, with women to um, help reduce their fuel usage, we are developing an online training course right now, which should reduce um, our project costs substantially. And you can look at this later if you're interested or shoot me an email. And I'll end with why everybody needs a solar cooker. Just <laughs> even in the US, it's great as an outdoor grill alternative. Um, there's some powerful parabolics which will grill your food. And you never know when you'll be, you know, a hurricane will hit your town and then your only way to cook food will be solar cooking on top of your roof, roof like this lady here. Um, it's also great for living off grid if you live in a tiny house, for camping, for sailing, you know, reduce the fuel you bring on a boat. And that's it. That concludes my presentation. Thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Sophie. Um, I love seeing the diversity of designs and, the, and all the different ways that you can harness solar energy to cook something. It's, it's fascinating. And we already have some questions coming in that we will, that we will get to later. Um, our next speaker, uh, who's going to be switching over to the topic of um, 
uh, Energy Systems um, is Alexis Sigler, who is the director at Living Energy Farm in Virginia in the United States. Alexis? So Living Energy Farm, we are a community and technology development uh, center in uh, Central Virginia. Uh, the big difference with us is that we live the technologies we are trying to encourage other people to, to use. Uh, so for over 10 years now, we've been developing renewable energy systems. Uh, our intention is to keep them as small uh, and durable as possible. Uh, most of my slideshow is going to be about what we call a DC microgrid. It's um, a way we've discovered to use uh, DC energy that uh, solar energy that has proven very effective for us. Um, uh, so the way a DC microgrid works, and also I should say from this first slide, we published a book, Empowering Communities. Uh, you can go to livingenergyfarm.org and you can download that or you can get it directly from us. So the way a DC microgrid works, um, golly, I wish I was better, there we go, uh, is we have a multi-leveled uh, energy system uh, we, uh, the biggest thing that we do that's different than traditional off-grid systems is that we do a lot of what we call daylight drive. So we have all kinds of uh, equipment, uh, including solar cookers incidentally, uh, that uh, run directly from the solar panels. Um, so we can run, we can grind grain, we can cut firewood, we can pump water. And now we're doing about 70% of our cooking now with insulated solar electric cookers. Uh, this is a project in conjunction with a working group at Cal Poly. Um, to develop these cookers and disseminate them around the world. Uh, it works great. Uh, the cookers now, we were using thermal cookers before and doing maybe 10% of our cooking. Now we're doing about 70% of our cooking uh, with these cookers. Um, so that's the big thing we do that uh, we do a lot of daylight drive, running things straight off the solar panels. Surprisingly, you can run, you can really overload these systems with an AC based system, alternative current based system, uh, alternating current based system, you have to have more supply than you have demand. With the DC system, you can actually run about 3000 watts worth of motors off of 1000 watts worth of supply. It's simply industrial brush motors and these thermal systems tolerate tremendous power input swings very gracefully, doesn't do any harm. Um, the second aspect of how these microgrids work is uh, because we have a dramatic reduction in how much money we're spending on batteries and inverters and that sort of equipment, we increase the amount of, uh, we can increase, improve the equality of what we're using. Uh, so this picture on the left is my daughter with a nickel iron battery from 1946 that still works. Uh, the nickel iron batteries, they're big, they're bulky, but they last for many decades. They're somewhat more expensive. This isn't a critical aspect of the, of the design, but uh, we do like them, they do work well. So a graphic display of how this works is with a traditional off-grid system, you've got battery costs are quite large. Uh, you've got significant inverter cost. Uh, then you've got your PV cost, and that uh, gives you how much total work you can do in a day. With our system, the battery cost was reduced about 90%. Uh, there's no AC power, there's no electronics, a small amount of inverters, perhaps a somewhat larger investment in PV power um, and the total daily work accomplished grows significantly. And you notice we use, we don't use the phrase uh, total power output because the power output doesn't matter. It's how much work you can do. So we're not worried about stored kilowatts. We're worried about uh, what we can do in a day. And we can do a lot more with our systems than we can do with battery-based systems. Um, uh, so another uh, aspect of how these systems are uh, much more effective is that the components we're using are extremely durable. Uh, solar panels, they are made by big corporations, but they last for many decades. Uh, DC industrial motors uh, and the thermal systems as well. But the DC industrial motors, they're copper wire and magnets. They last for many decades. This particular machine is in our shop. We run a, a fully tooled machine shop. It's uh, actually a drill press from the late 1800s uh, running on a motor that will last for decades with a solar panel that will last for decades. Uh, this equipment will last uh, multiple lifetimes. Um, my computer is misbehaving on me here. All right, there we go. Uh, the other advantage of this system is that uh, the annual uh, cost, we have no cost for replacing batteries. A normal off-grid house spends hundreds or even a thousand or two thousand dollars a year replacing batteries to run a bunch of AC equipment. 
we find ways to store energy that don't involve batteries that uh, involve near zero uh, daily, monthly, yearly costs. So for water, for instance, we have a, a DC pump that pumps into a storage tank. Uh, that equipment is not free, but that is a, it's called a fiber wound tank. It'll last for many decades. So you're looking at a zero cost to run that on a daily basis. Instead of having an AC refrigerator with inverters or with centralized industrial power systems, we have thickly insulated DC refrigerators that store, uh, stay cold overnight, so you don't have to worry about running AC power. Um, this is a graphic layout of our whole system at Living Energy Farm. Uh, the blue squares are power supplies, the red squares are uh, loads, the green squares are battery supported loads. So uh, because this is a multilinear system, there's never a general power failure. Basically the lights never go out. And 12 years, a dozen people living off grid, we're economically self-sufficient, largely food self-sufficient, living on a poverty level budget, and we've never had, a, 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 never had a, the lights go out. So we have very small systems such as a PV panel running a pump to pump uh, hot water for a thermal system. Uh, the biggest system we have is a high voltage DC system with over 22 loads on it. Uh, that runs a machine shop, it cooks 70% of our food. It uh, runs the heating blowers for our buildings. Um, so it's a very resilient system. There's, there's never a general power failure. Another advantage of these systems is that it's very scalable. You can do very small scale systems. You can do larger commercial systems. So we're, we have three projects now. We have one that we started in Arizona on the Hopi and uh, Navajo nations. We have one ongoing in uh, Jamaica, and now we're starting a project in Puerto Rico. Uh, we can do small battery kits that are very durable that can charge laptops, cell phones. Uh, this is a kit, uh, workshop in Jamaica making those, assembling those battery kits. We have commercial scale equipment at Living Energy Farm, a machine shop, agricultural equipment. We set up a commercial scale food processing facility in Jamaica. And again, the difference here is uh, that, so this is Charlie who might help me put those solar panels on the roof. That is in the poorest part of Jamaica. Once this system is set up, it's not free, uh, but it will run uh, uh, commercial scale equipment for many, many years to come with no ongoing power bill. So they're uh, processing breadfruit and other agricultural products into value added products that the farmers can then sell. Uh, another advantage of our DC microgrid, uh, some, several people have mentioned the war in Ukraine. Uh, the supplies of fossil fuel are of course a big issue for all of us. The, one of the things that has crippled solar thermal in general, particularly solar space heating is that it has been over-designed, overbuilt. It is uh, basically because it tries to imitate grid power. It's the same problem, it's the legacy problem, the same problem we have with big, big battery systems where we have a battery and an inverter to make AC power to, uh, to power uh, the appliances that we're accustomed to. It's the same problem with uh, solar thermal in that we want a thermostatic system. So some th uh, thermal systems have been built with big solar storage tanks, um, computerized controllers. This system is simply a very cheap glass uh, over black metal collector on the roof, daylight drive uh, pumps, air blowers. So again, the blowers are connected directly to the solar panels, just like our, all our other equipment, pulls the heat off the roof directly, goes directly under the floor. So we're using thermal storage instead of electrical storage. Uh, this is very cheap uh, and it runs, it'll run forever, many, many years. Um, so if all of this works so well, why haven't you heard of it? Uh, there's several uh, issues. Uh, the first is a lack of DC equipment. All our markets have been standardized to, uh, to AC equipment. So if you want a solar fan or a solar refrigerator or a good solar cooker, uh, you, you can't get it. It's not on the market. So what we're doing uh, in Jamaica, in Puerto Rico, is we're setting up supply chains to bring this equipment in. Um, some of it, like this little solar fan, pretty cheap, $20 out of China, but you've got to have $20,000 to bring in a container of them. So we're bringing those in. Some equipment, a lot of uh, household appliances, any appliance that you can pick up and walk around with will actually run DC. They have universal motors in them. So a little hot plate or a blender, you can actually run it straight DC. You do have to swap out the switches. You can't run AC switches. Uh, computers and electronics, you simply have to get the right charge cords. Uh, this solar cooker here on our right is our latest version. Um, and solar cooking is a great idea. This cooker actually is much better in terms of usability. Like I said, we're doing 70% of our cooking now with this style of cooker. Um, so these can be manufactured locally, which is of course an economic benefit to the people there. Um, so we'll be setting up production facilities. We have a production facility now in Virginia making those. 
The other big issue that has, uh, the reason we don't already have DC microgrids is that because of the uh, uh, solar energy has become very politicized to the extent that the big power companies and our economy in general uh, supports the centralized development, centralized power companies. So we now have these big solar fields and it's a bit of a no brainer that if you put where the, the locus of capital investment, where you put the money is where you tend to have good things. So we have very expensive, very well-built power plants, whether they're fossil fuel power, powered or nominally renewable. And then we have badly built houses. This house that's shining red, that's an infrared camera on a house nearby Living Energy Farm. In the middle of winter, the sun doesn't shine in winter. So that house, no matter how much solar energy you build, is still fossil fuel powered. Whereas our house at Living Energy Farm, we went through this past winter in Virginia. This is the same night. Those pictures were taken minutes apart. Our house is leaking almost no heat. We went through this past winter with basically no firewood, just pulling the heat off the roof, put it in the floor, um, and it, it works. Uh, but it's not, it doesn't fit our current consumer economy. It doesn't fit our current tendency to want big centralized solutions. The two uh, goal, the two prizes, the two things we can achieve if we can uh, spread DC microgrids all over the world is that it can provide energy to, it's, they're much cheaper systems, they're scalable, uh, there are 2.2 billion people worldwide who do not have reliable grid power. This can supply power for them. Um, and the bigger prize, we all know that the climate change crisis is a huge issue. And DC microgrids have a radically lower environmental footprint. Uh, we can uh, make a dramatic imprint, uh, impact on climate change gases if we can spread this energy system around the world. So I'll leave you with uh, Greta Thunberg and her, I don't want you to panic. I don't want you to hope, I want you to panic. Um, I've used the phrase constructive panic that uh, we don't need, uh, we need to respond to this with the appropriate, uh, the appropriate emotional response, which is uh, uh, to, uh, to do th uh, what we need to do quickly. What a great note to end on. Thank you, Alexis. Um, and can I just say how much I love how people come out of the woodwork during these conversations with their own low tech stories about using a solar cooker or using a compost toilet or being exposed to a microgrid. I think this is, um, I, I'm so glad you're all sharing so many examples. So we do have one more speaker. And um, just as a, just to let you know, um, I talked to Linda, we are gonna go a few minutes past, um, past the hour just to allow time for questions. Um, if you're able to stay with us or share your resources and, and stories before you leave. Um, our last speaker is Olivia Bory, a PhD student from France who is gonna tell us about her research on um, energy for autonomous households. Olivia. So good morning everyone. I'm uh, Olivia bory -Davis. I'm currently working at Integral Engineering as a PhD student. This is a company specialized in conception, uh, building conception. This is a research project, uh, project in collaboration with Energy Lab at University of Reunion Island and Eltis Laboratory from uh, Grenoble Institute of Technology. So I'm uh, happy to share with you my uh, research thematic, which is called DC Architecture, uh, Microwave Architecture Development with Energy Production and Hybrid Storage for Standalone Building. So to start, I will. Um, uh, begin with uh, some words about the context. As we know, it's essential that we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, which are currently strongly linked to our energy production, dependent on oil and gas. This is an even greater priority for isolated territories, which due to their geographical position, require funding autonomous and sustainable energy production solutions. Currently living in Réunion, a French overseas department located next to Mauritius, I would like to introduce you the energy issues that we encounter here. First of all, the part of renewable energy represents only 32% of Renewable energy mix. So as part of the energy transition for uh, green growth and the French decree, one of the goals is to reach energy autonomy for overseas departments in 2030. Moreover, in 2025, according to the BICS decree, buildings will have to justify their energetic consumptions by instrumentation. So if we take a look on the Reunion's energy, tertiary and residential buildings are the main energy consumers and due to a really nice climate, sometimes too hot, air conditioning is the main energy load. 
So this concerns city, but other problems exist here for insulated sites, such as, for example, Mafat, which is a wild natural um, place where the houses are only accessible by foot. So the autonomous electrical architectures deployed require um, most of the time generators. They are generally oversized to meet the energy requirements. So this is not a solution for resilience because um, grow the number of solar panel and battery is not the best choice. And finally, with the renewable energy insertion in the grid this last year, an old debate is growing up between alternative and direct current. Indeed, to use solar energy, we need many converters between solar panel and our equipment. First, we convert direct current in alternative uh, for our grid, and then we uh, convert it a second time for DC equipment like LEDs, uh, screens, computers, data centers, and some motors. This is not optimal and creates a lot of energy losses, but currently we don't know exactly how to quantify energy savings which are possible with DC current. That's why um, my research goals are divided in three points. First, uh, develop new DC architectures to research uh, to reduce energy losses linked to converters and electrical light transport. According to uh, uh, the state of art, uh, experts has, uh, have an estimation of um, almost 50% per, um, for the motor. So I'm uh, currently standing up an experimental DC measurement bench in the laboratory. I, um, I'm also uh, introducing many environmental and current sensors to control the efficiency of the architecture and to control this data. I will use statistical indicators in an application. And suddenly, my main objective is to set up an energy management system to deliver energy at the right time, taking into account external conditions, user comfort, and the state of health of the storage equipment. This is in order to reduce the overall energy consumption of the system. And the main constraint uh, is to have no fuel support. On this slide, uh, you can see a simplified diagram of the architecture of the DC test bench that we want to put in place. And this is where LOTEC comes in because to carry out uh, our environmental measurements, we test various components including wired and wireless sensors. They communicate according to different communication protocols, such as uh, low power technologies. The openness and accessibility of equipment in terms of development depends on the supplier and the degree of stability that uh, someone which to deploy. Uh, for data storage monitoring, we use a free database management system. And with the help of a fellow IT developer, we connect the database to a mobile app to automate, automate data analysis. Concerning the electrical loads, uh, they are managed by the power over Ethernet protocol, which operates at 48 um, volt uh, DC and allows us to power and control the equipment via a single RG45 uh, network cable. In resume, the innovation of our architecture is mainly in the fact that we have the consumption of each element, and we will have the possibility to adjust the power of each point uh, separately. Um, it also means that um, the energy management system will have a lot of new and numerous parameters, and this is a challenge to associate energy consumption and user comfort. Thanks to the development of this system, the goal is to promote self-consumption as much as possible and uh, drastically reduce the use of storage. So the next, um, for the moment, we are starting for the lighting and the fan. So um, the main goal of this test bench is to test first a classical architecture with a lot of converters between alternative currents and DC currents and do the same thing with same equipment, but, but with DC architectures and evaluate which is more efficient. 
So we will um, take all the data in the database and uh, generate automated evaluation of the electrical architectures in the form of a multi-parameters radar chart, which will compare for each uh, architecture, uh, total of wearing costs, electrical line transport losses, resilience, carbon impact, and energy savings um, at, with the taking into account user comfort. So thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Olivia. Um, this is fascinating, and I look forward to reading more about it. Um, so it is tw it is twelve o'clock Boston time. I uh, totally understand if anyone needs to jump off. Um, thank you so much for coming. But we do have a few um, questions that I'd like to ask the panelists before we conclude. Um, we have a couple of questions for Sophie. Um, someone asked, "What do you think of cooking bags?" In the chat. Yeah. Um. Is he talking about heat retention baskets? I that would be my guess. Yes, yeah, they I have. definitely have think. Um, yeah, heat retention baskets are great, and they should definitely be used in conjunction with solar cookers. Um, they can um, finish the cooking process uh, just with the mm -hmm. retained heat, and um, so that that's great for for use not just with solar cookers but any type of cook stove. So, okay. Yeah, I didn't have time to go over every single type of technology, unfortunately. And there's plenty of other types of solar cookers I didn't even have time to, to address, but yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I have a sort of a behavioral question. Um, someone said the cooking with, so with a solar cooker is sometimes longer than a classical um, fossil fuel cooker. Um, should people that change to a solar cooker modify the organization of their day um, by cooking at different times of day maybe? And is that a problem for families? How have you found that behavior change to, to go? Um, <clears throat> I mean, it, yes, You if you cook longer, then you'll need to start earlier generally. But for some people, that can be a bonus. Um, the nice thing about cooking with a panel cooker, which is like a crock pot, is that you don't need to stick around and keep on stirring the pot. And um, you don't need to stick around. So you can just put it out in the morning. Um, you know, leave for a few hours, come back and it'll be done. So in many, for maybe it will require you to reorganize your day or maybe it'll actually be um, easier. Right, right. So so behavior change doesn't have to be a bad thing. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would like to ask a similar question to Alexis um, in terms of, you know, are there any sort of behavior change expectations or sort of, um, um, issues that you run into in thinking about your work that um, that have required a learning curve or a different approach? Uh, yeah, definitely. And it, the interesting thing about the DC microgrid, and I did not predict this, is it actually encourages people to conserve energy. We tend to think of energy consumption as this negative side of human nature. What we have at Living Energy Farm, the electrical systems, the, the water system, every system that we have, we can slowly so it's a, for most people, it's about a 48 hour learning curve. Within a, two days, you get it. You have to pay attention to the weather. You're not gonna water the garden at five o'clock in the afternoon because you'll drain the water storage tanks. You won't water it at nine o'clock in the morning. Um, as Sovi mentioned, cooking, you know, you think about it ahead of time. Um, the advantage with these ISICs, the insulated solar electric cookers is they're, you're actually indoors using them. But in any case, there are behavioral changes that have to occur but it's usually only two or three days most people get it. Some people take a little longer. And the net result is a dramatic reduction in total environmental impact and a natural kind of people learn to have an inbuilt tendency to conserve energy rather than an inbuilt tendency to, to waste energy because that's how the system is set up. Mm. Interesting. Well, I, had, I, I hung on to a question that was asked in the first hour, but I'd love for, for Olivia or Alexis to answer, to share their thoughts. Um, the question was, does the low-tech school of thought believe that electrical-based infrastructure is sustainable? Um, any thoughts about sort of electrical grids um, versus other solutions? I mean, in the long term, no, it's not. But what, so a lot of people have a lot of ideas and that's great, but what, what works, you know? So we live, we have no generators, no backup, anything. We live with what we have. And it would be brutally inconvenient to not have some external energy sources. And the solar panels, most of the big economic research institutions have estimated somewhere around 500 watts per person to sustain people. We're about 200 watts per person. 
food self-sufficient, economically self-sufficient. So no, 500 years from now, we might not have photovoltaic panels, I'm not sure. But for now, it, it, you know, it's not a question of moral purity, it's just a question of what works. This is what works, and if we can use them in a moderate and intelligent way, that's what makes sense. Moderate and intelligent, I like that. <laughs> Olivia, any other thoughts to add in terms of um, your research? Electricity versus, versus other solutions or any potential unintended um, challenges that have come up? Yes, um, for the challenges, uh, one of the challenges Main changes is uh, different um, standards for equipment because uh, we didn't have any rule. So each uh, constructor uh, made its own um, voltage, for example. And so the research is how to make a transition with all the different equipments and uh, switch with uh, DC distribution, electrical distribution. And we have one question from Greg in the chat um, saying, where can we find a database with impact data for different low tech projects? I know um, uh, Linda and Sophie have answered in the chat, um, but do any other panelists have anything to add? Any other resources where we might sort of be able to dig into some of the data on, the, on this work? I'll throw one in, um, Engineering for Change um, is a website. It doesn't talk about impact, but it does, sort of crowdsource um, a lot of different um, plans, products, designs, ideas um, in one place. So I would recommend Googling that. And Cedric, I saw you um, unmuting yourself. Yeah, the, the, also, of course there is the Solar, the, the, the Low Tech Magazine. These uh -huh. people, uh, they are based in Netherlands. They make a great work for years now. And, um, and of course, paleo energetic. You can you can also like share it. You can you can push some ideas inside. You can you can make a group to look for a, a great innovation and patent into the the U.S. patent office. I think there is the, uh, with the MIT D lab. To, you have a, a huge uh, resource in into your into your country. And and. Mm -hmm. I can say yeah, we, we, we have the plan to make the, the website translated in Russian oh, excellent. because, uh, because uh, the, the Russian, they have this, uh, this uh, how can we say that? They have this, um, this tradition of making a sort of a sustainable product because, because of the communism. So they have an approach of the, of the technology that is uh, totally different from the from our approach in, in Europe or in United States. So, and in, in energy, they have a lot of patents that, that are really uh, powerful, interesting, but uh, the patents, uh, they, are, they are not translated in English, it's only in Cyrillic. So, uh, but we are interested to, uh, to bridge with the people. Be, be, okay, there is the war, but we have to, to take care of the people of the region. We have to, to make a sort of a bridge for peace with the Russian. And, and I think they realize because the, the war is destroying the economy also. So, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the people, they will suffer in Russia also. And we have to bridge with the people. So that, that, that is one of our goal and to, to translate in Chinese, in, uh, in Indian uh, also too, because all the territories, they have their, their, their their resources, their roots, their people facing crisis and mm -hmm. uh, innovating. When the crisis is there, the people are innovating a lot. So, um, yeah. Thank you for those thoughts. I feel like we need to put a pin in that in that discussion and have another webinar just about that <laughs> and to, to take it in a different direction. Um, but thank you all so much to honor your time. I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it up here. Um, I encourage you all to make use of the resources that everyone has shared in the chat, and we will be sharing the recording and the and the chat transcript with you afterwards, so you can pursue those connections. Um, thank you to all seven of my colleagues who agreed to speak on the panel today, um, and thank you to the French Embassy for inviting me to moderate. I wish you all a, a wonderful Earth Day, and stay safe and healthy. Bye bye. That's it for another extra long episode. We'll be back to our regular programming in a week or two. The Low Tech Podcast is put out by the Low Technology Institute, and at the moment, the show is hosted, edited, and distributed by me, Scott Johnson, but stay tuned for changes in that team. 
This episode was recorded in the Low Technology Institute Gardens. Uh, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, YouTube, and elsewhere. We hope you've enjoyed this free podcast. If you'd like to join the community and help support the work we do, please consider going to patreon.com slash lowtechinstitute and signing up. The Low Technology Institute is a 501c3 research organization supported by members, grants, and underwriting. You can find out more information about the Low Technology Institute, membership, and underwriting at lowtechinstitute.org. You can find us on social media, and you can reach me directly. I'm scott at lowtechinstitute.org. Our intro music today was Early Sun off the album Bittersweet Endings by Crowander. That song is under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial License, and this podcast is under the Creative Commons Attribution and Sharealike License, meaning you're free to use and share it as long as you give us credit. Thanks and take care, and I'm going to come in out of the rain now. <laughs>